we're talking all about brand and growth. Most businesses are only really great at one. We're going to tell you the secrets of being amazing at both. We're joined by Joanna Lord, who's EIR at Reforge, who is going to break down the secrets of both of those with us today. I'm your co-host, Kit Bodner, CMO of HubSpot, joined as always by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, the CMO at Zapier, and this is Marketing Against the Grain. Let's get into today's show. Kieran, we have a very special topic, a topic that I would say gets brought up to us every single week. In fact, I was talking to somebody this week, like I'm hiring a new marketing leader. Do I want somebody who's really good at brand (laughs) or really good at growth? I don't know. And we're going to talk all about that on today's show. Because you can never have both. You can never uh, have both unless it's Joanna. Joanna to do some advisory work for you. (laughs) (laughs) So that that has been our that has been our experience, Joanna. I don't I don't know how you feel about this, but I get the same question all the time, which is a founder thinks through this. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I'm going to hire a marketing leader and I'm either going to like prioritize having an incredible brand and messaging and creative and product positioning, or I'm going to have an incredible go to market and a kind of engine that's predictable and scalable. But I can't have both. I know that like it's too it's too hard to get both. You are one of the few people like you can look through your track record where you have done both. You've built incredible brands. You had an incredible growth team at Skyscanner. Is this the right way for a founder to think about it, brand or growth? Or can you have both? And how do you have both? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to come in spicy out of the gate on this. Like, you have to have both. Um, but I think I, I'm also, like, I'm a pragmatist, right? I, I do think, depending on the company stage and where you are and your level of resources, you always see that a company has a predisposition to one or the other. Not surprising. Like, it's usually the founder's strengths. Like, it's, it's what the founder, whichever one the founder either came and, from or yes. was closer to. I think there are things you can do. I think there are approaches, styles, operating cadences, skill sets, and actual tactics you do to make sure a company is set up to do both well. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, you know, but I I do, I think it's really dangerous. And I get asked this, you get asked once a week, Kip, I get asked 10 times a day. Like, um, I'm looking for a marketing leader. Which background should I look for? So it's a, I think it's a hard to find in one leader. So that's fair. But more and more, it's becoming expected. I right. Think. Yeah, it is it's a couple of things. One, one, I love that we have like thrown subtle shade on product marketing and that they're just not even included in this discussion. And I did like, say product position in. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I actually, just, you know, I consider myself a triad and I actually think that they're so interconnected. It is in part, it's, it's like hard to kind of separate them out. I do think product marketing is a really interesting topic right now, baby. You've been talking to more and more people about this because it's having its moment. Like, I think growth had its moment. I think brand had a a bit of a moment because everything became more competitive. Even if you had a great product, there were a lot of great products on the market. And I think now we have less resources, less budget, more companies, and differentiation is even more important than ever. So, you know, I think we go through these seasons, if you will, over the years. And I do not throw shade on product marketing at all. I do. I do. I, do. I would wait for Kip to give his spicy product marketing <laughs> take. Let's I, go. Most of the technical founders I talk to, it's like, oh, yeah, my first marketing hire is product, a product <laughs> marketing leader, and they're going to do product marketing. I'm like, product marketing is not your problem. And I don't think product marketing should be the marketing leader's core skill set. Like, distribution is undefeated for a reason. You know, like, distribution is the catalyst. Like, if you have enough distribution, you can iterate and figure out your positioning. And I know that's like a controversial topic, like take, I think, but like I get driven nuts by these companies that like have two or three marketers and they're all doing product marketing. <laughs> yeah. And yep. I'm just like, well, that what the I, hell are you doing? I do come into a lot of companies that have a lot of product marketers and then they wonder why no one knows they exist. And we we talk a little bit about that. I think there's like, there's yeah, a, why they're not growing. Here's what, what here's my, my hot take on this, Kip. I think product marketing means a lot of things to a lot of people. But if, but if it means who do I serve? How do I position to meet them? How do I price? And how do I package? I think too many companies don't think enough about those those questions. And they just start to grow on the wrong pricing model with the wrong package for the wrong people. So I'd probably, you and I would go like this a bit, well, you know? Well, no, no. I, uh, so I actually have been violent agreement of pricing and packaging is just completely underutilized yeah. by most companies. I just yeah. don't think that's a job of product marketing. I don't think product marketing should be doing pricing and packaging. I think you have some type of strategy leader or, mm-hmm. or analyst leader who is, should be running that. But yeah. most companies that I talk to, their pricing is far under leveraged. And one of the best ways they could grow is by just simply fixing pricing and packaging. I'm yeah. with you on that. One. I really agree that like a lot of teams are 
shaped the biases of their founder. Like the founder I would probably least like to work with is a founder who has like incredibly strong views about design, like the CEO of Airbnb, right? Like from a design background, because it's so subjective and you can just imagine that they'll have thoughts on every single little piece of collateral that actually comes out from the marketing team, whether it's important or not. But yeah. one of the things I would be curious on, Joanna, is what do you tell founders? So yeah. how do you break that down for them? Hey, like, should I hire someone who's incredible on this side of the spectrum or this side of the spectrum? Like, what do you tell them and how do you break that problem down for them? I've spent a lot of time on my portfolio of answers for this, but it kind of comes down to my quick kind of snippet, which is stop thinking in the triad of marketing when you hire a marketing leader. It's a false promise. Instead, think about their strength. So any marketing leader will spike. I started in growth. I was like one of the first AdWords advertisers ever like on the platform. I started in performance. I was paid marketing. Over the years, learned inbound, started to think about activation in the funnel, started thinking about retention, which took me to product marketing and positioning and pricing, which got me excited about customer success ended up doing a couple of rebrands, like it organically built over time. And I just kept a curiosity about it. So I think every marketing leader that you come across will spike in one. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what is their core capability around the spike? And it's usually one of a couple of things. They're a great storyteller. They're really good at technology, like MarTech kind of data analytics, kind of very technical. They're really good at growth capabilities, like early testing, experimentation, you know, thesis driven, or they tend to be customer first centric, right? So it's actually about these four capabilities of marketing leaders. And that's what you should hire for. Because depending on your category, your product, your stage, who your founder is, what the rest of the C-levels look like, you're looking to round out the table with one of those capabilities. And they will learn the domains if you set up the right environment for them. So I, I, I don't think about marketing leaders in the traditional yeah. triad. You know, the things that I've seen go most wrong for a founder in terms of the companies that I've advised or invested in is they do what you said, Kip, actually, they hire like someone who's really spikes on product marketing and that person's incredible and the position and everything actually gets much, much better, but nothing grows. And that was yeah. their big thing is like, they just can't get the distribution thing going. And then the other one that I've seen that happens time and time again, and I try to like make sure I help founders not do this is they take someone who has, for the most part, run like really up market marketing plays and then put them into like a position where they're trying to like do scale things for like a real S&B broad based market. And that person just really struggles to go from like, how do I think about this like very specific segment to how do I just like do things that truly, truly scale? And I always see there's a huge struggle of that person trying to like fit into that rule. Yeah, so I, I've seen everything. I think Joanna, your, your summary is generally right, which is, hey, somebody's got a strength and then they're gonna learn the other stuff. But more importantly, they should be able to hire the people to do the other stuff. And actually, where I think most founders and companies screw up is that they hire somebody who has one strength, and that's often the wrong strength because mm -hmm. they're not clear on what they actually need that strength to be. So like that goes to your point. And then that person actually can't hire effectively to people to do the, the rest of the stuff. The problem here, is you need somebody who spikes at one thing. And I think for a lot of folks, it's gonna be the growth or brand, which is kind of what we're talking about today. But they need to have enough baseline knowledge of the other stuff yep, to understand what good looks like and to basically hire and manage somebody who's effective at those things, Yep, right? And what I see happen time and time again is you they hire somebody who's just a deep, deep, deep specialist in one of those areas. And it's like, cool. This person worked at a branding agency for 15 years. They've ran brand, they were VP of brand at a startup, and now you're gonna make them your CMO. Awesome, but they don't have any basis for how to do any of the other stuff. Yep. And they're not gonna be able to actually build a team to do any of the other stuff. That resonates with me, Kip, because, and I, I think about this in the like journey of a marketer, which is we all know about T-shaped marketers, right? You're specialists between channels. Then you grow into being a marketing leader and the T becomes about the domains. You might be deep in growth, but you need to understand brand. You need to understand product marketing. You might need to be able to understand certain category, you know, vertical marketing. And then you grow to be an executive and you need to become functionally a T, which is marketing is what you're deep in. But you need to be great at operations and finance and product. And that's like a journey that I think great marketing leaders get curious about 
Like they want to grow on that spectrum. And I think it's what you said, Kip. You get good at hiring. You augment yourself. I don't, I'm, I'm not the best performance marketer anymore, but I know how to build a great team. I know what it takes to do that well. And so I hire the right people to do that for me. If you're in marketing, just go listen to that last like 60 seconds, because I think that was the best summation of a career in 60 seconds that I have ever heard. And the, Joanna, you nailed what it looks like to go on that journey. And I don't know, that's what I've experienced. Kieran, did that resonate with you? Yeah, I, I honestly think that. So like part of the reason I wanted to do the role at Zapier is because I got to do the marketing part and the growth part. So sit in the middle of that kind of like two circle Venn diagram. But definitely the one of the harder parts is just the continual context switching. Like you probably have found that, Joanna, you probably find that Kip is like, if you're on, you're on like ha a series of half an hour meetings, like I was on eight hours <laughs> straight of half an hour meetings. And like every half an hour meeting was about a different problem within a different fun, yeah. like a different team with a different skill set. And the context switching you're doing between each meeting is just like a lot to deal with. <laughs> and to your point, like some, yeah. some of them you can kind of break down, you kind of know that thing. Some of them you have to like, like really figure out what they mean before you can actually offer value. And just that context switching is one mm -hmm. of the hardest parts, I think, about having a broad based function. Well, and Joanna, you do that basically on steroids because you help a bunch of different companies at the same time. Yeah. And so you're like context switching on top of context switching. Like, like, what are the secrets? Like, how do you get that right? If Because I do believe with Kira that that is one of the hardest things about being a marketing leader yeah. is context switching. A hundred percent. And it's funny because uh, I feel like, Kieran, what you just said is what I felt when I was in-house every job I've taken, uh, which is like just frantic. I think a lot of that, my best advice when you are in-house <laughs> and you are context switching is to think about your time management differently. So I would block out like Monday was growth. I do my one-on-one -on -one 30 minutes. I would do my pre-read strategy. I would do my tactical working sessions. Maybe I'm looking, giving feedback on things like... Tuesday was brand, you know, Wednesday, my product counterpart. So I do think when you're in-house, there's a way to orchestrate your day to enable you to have context in the morning and only get more effective throughout the day. I think what Kip said, now that I'm consulting, it is manic. I had a, I had a meeting at like 8 a.m. this morning talking about self-driving cars. <laughs> at 11 a.m., I was talking about a beauty brand. After this, I'm talking to someone about a wine company. And I think, you know, it's, it's a different skill. Yeah. I have to do a lot more prep in the morning before any calls. I have to do a lot more time after my daughter goes down, thinking about what I, what, what, what I did throughout the day and like codifying it. So they're different problems, but it, it's something we all feel for sure. We all feel it on some level. Okay, so one of the things Kip and I have talked about a lot, Joanna, and you actually mentioned it around why product marketing ha is having its moment is because of the lack of differentiation. And I suspect a lot of people who had growth marketer in their role will manage to find their way into like product marketing growth marketer <laughs> because it's the thing yep. that will start to trend. But the lack of differentiation is only going to increase mm -hmm. because AI makes commoditizes software. And so every brand starts to look the same. I've talked to like four or five AI brands and they're doing really killer things, but they kind of like sound the same. Like it's hard to differentiate between how, they how they're different. And so we really believe like brand is going to matter even more in that future, like how you message, how you like live within the kind of world, what you actually stand for. Maybe could you just give us your summation of like, what does it take to create a world-class brand? Like, how do you think about that problem if you had to give a founder some tips and tricks on how to go about creating that? I very much agree with you. I think we are only increasing the need to have really strong points of view on why you exist. I do think you know, that is brand. Our ability to have people hear why we exist is growth. So I think it, I still think it's very close to each other. But I think all day about what makes a brand world class, like partly because I get asked all the time, what brands do you point to? Which ones do you emulate? And I think for years, I'd point to the Nikes and the Patagonias and the Apples. And I'd think about Rolex or Chanel and like why these brands. But I got really even more interested in this new age brands. Like, how did these remarkable brands in less than two or three decades become remarkable? So like, you know, the Yetis, the Glossiers, the Bumbles, right? Like how, how have they become brands that we look at when we are like, who's doing interesting, you know, who's doing interesting work? And I, for me, I think it comes down to three things. I think one, they have to stand for something. And I, I could talk at lengths about this, but largely a really strong understanding of vision and mission and 
all of those pieces and, you know, how, you know, how do you do it differently than someone else? The second is the customer voice. I think every company says they do it. Most companies suck at it. Absolutely yeah. horrible. They have an ICP or a persona, yeah. but they do not understand their customer. And then the third one, and this is the one that I think most CEOs and founders completely fail at, is understanding the cultural zeitgeist, like what's happening, staying relevant. Like the world-class brands are on top yes. of things. And, you know, for better, or for worse, tech companies turn inward. We go super narrow. We're like obsessed with our one product and our one positioning and our customer. And we forget to look around and like, hey, is the entire world blowing up? Like, is there like social disarray? Maybe we should find out how our customers are feeling. And so I think if you un, if you look at every brand, the biggest and best and the newest and best, all of them have found ways to operationalize those three areas. And I think it makes a world-class brand when you do. If it's possible to enter a, a motivational slow clap right here, I would like to do it because that is like what I believe in the world, especially, especially the cultural zeitgeist, right? Like Kieran and I have a big belief that, you know, culture and business are on are closer together now than they've ever been before. Yep. Right. And if your business is not relevant in culture and doesn't understand culture, it's basically impossible to build a real brand today. Yeah. Right. But practically, like I agree with I agree with everything you just said. If you're a startup founder or you're an established business CEO and you, you know, you've got some ad agencies pitching you, you've got a head of brand kind of chirping in your ear. Like, what are the actual things you start to do? to get to make some of those things happen. Like the principles yeah. are right. Like what are some examples of things you do or have seen people do to like actually get there? I love that you said chirping. I sometimes feel I often chirp. I'm quite the chirper. And I I do, I think that there is a lot of noise <laughs> <laughs> when you're trying to think about a being, especially for a CEO or founder of a startup that has no exposure to brand. Like I actually have very high empathy for that. They know it's important. They have no idea where to start. And it's never like malicious. I know lo I no longer hear brand is useless. I now hear I know it's important, but I don't know where to start. So like real tactically, I'll, I'll run through all three, just like the one or two things I'd do. What you stand for, you're a founder, one page doc that says what you believe the future should look like in your category and why it's different and what you're going to do to get there that's unique. And I would probably sit down on the two or three top social issues or economic issues around that category and ask yourself, where do we stand on them? And I think um, I'll throw out this stat because it always blows my mind. 21% of founders think they need to take a stand on social or economical issues. 86% of consumers expect you to. So like there's a massive disconnect. Founders don't want to touch it. Consumers expect it. And so like just a one page, spend three hours on it and... Ride that for two years if you need to. On the second one for customer voice. Oh, totally. I, yeah, I, I, it's, it's like you end up, you end up, you can get a lot for a little. When it comes to customer voice, I think customer research is one thing. I think having a customer advisory board, bringing the voice of the customer into every meeting, going and sitting with your customers and their real life experiences, like shopping amongst them, with them, sitting with them at their desks. Like there's a different level of understanding your customer and what they need. Asking them questions like, what's keeping you up at night? What are you scared about? Versus what would you pay us for? Like these are really different questions uh, that I think I'd ask. And then on the on the Zeitgeist one, this one actually, it's just, it's being a student of of the of the market. It's reading news in the morning. It's watching social media, following hashtags, finding five to 10 people that talk about your industry in any capacity with differing opinions and reading what they're saying. Like it's having your thumb on the pulse. And I think a lot of founders and CEOs skip that. I think a lot of them cut that from their day because they get too busy and it's the exact mm. wrong thing to cut. Well, you can't make taste if you don't have any taste. And mm -hmm. you have to consume a lot of things to actually have a perspective and develop a sense of taste. Yeah, that, and you I have think, to have a point of view. I mean, I, I mean, Kieran, yeah. I mean, I bet you would, you had no taste. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I just had to develop the taste to fit in. But you mm -hmm. know, the other thing that's really important within brand that I've been obsessing over is like the simplicity of the message, because mm -hmm. we are living in a world where people just spend less time trying to understand something. And the, actually all of the things that are growing in popularity is to decrease our attention, like TikTok short from video, like all of these things are actually decreasing the amount of attention we spend on something. So you have a consumer that actually just wants simplicity of the message. And I don't know if you've seen um, these IKEA ads. Like they're one of my favorite examples of this, where 
they have like one of the ads is they have, they show a um, baby's cot, right? A baby crib, I think it's called in the yep. US. I don't know if you call it cot. cot but we don't call babies cot. in camping. cot. So look, the camera, <laughs> the camera is focused in and you see the crib and then it pans out and it's empty. And then it pans out to a baby lying on a mother in the bed. And it just says Ikea proudly second best. And I just think it like the, just the simplicity of the message, like really, really matters. Like all of that is captured within 20 seconds where you see some of these brand messaging and some of the, the, the adverts to like make you understand what a company does. And it's like, what did I just watch? Like, I don't understand anything about what I've just watched. And I think that that is a real art, like being able to say something really important, but I really haven't to say much is an incredible art form. I assure you the amount of research that just happened to get to that one idea, this idea that like the furniture is always in the room. And I bet a bunch of customers they talked to said something like, well, we, we put it together. We barely even use it because she's always asleep on me or he's always asleep on me. And like, that's what we yeah. call the brand idea. Yeah. It's like that one seed that you take and you're like, that has legs. And we had it, we had it at Skyscanner. The idea of travel beyond came from this idea of, I want to go beyond my one street. I want to go beyond what my parents saw. I, they never got to travel. I want to go beyond borders because I've never seen a second language. And like we had this idea where it's like it's traveling is about not the destination, not the trip. It's going beyond your perspective on the world. And like it came from multitudes, mm -hmm. hundreds of interviews that that led us there, you know, and it's just different. Do you think AI is going to help us get better at that? Like some the summation of all that brand research and interviews, like it's going to help us get better insights is, is going to force all brands to kind of sound the same because it's, you know, it's going to kind of pick the most obvious insights that if you serve any customer base, like are going to kind of be consistent across any company in that category. My short answer is it will help us get better. However, in the interim, it's going to make I us all so. sound the same. Yeah, and I think in the short term, it's every technology <laughs> starts as an idea of like what's possible and we abuse this new technology and we do all the wrong things with it. And then we start to add in layers of, okay, human intervention or moment, how do we use it best? So I think we will graduate from how can AI be used to how can it be used best? And I do, I absolutely believe long-term AI will make us better at this. Yeah. The, the place it can actually help today is actually it can do mass amounts of summarization for you. Mm -hmm. So if, if you actually have many, many calls with customers, it can summarize the notes and then categorize them into like categories and synthesize them for you. So you still have to like talk to the customers, but and it's based upon your data, but you can just do much more because it can summarize them and actually give them to you. I do think in the future, you'll be able to like programmatically in some way talk to customers through AI. And then like gather like, massive amounts of data and have it synthesize you. So again, I think the real power of AI, we've talked about this a little bit on the show, is when you can customize the models on your data and mm -hmm. you can actually like use that data in like in really incredible and powerful ways. I think we we talked about this last week. Joanne, I don't know how you think about it, Kip and I, which is the worst place to start in AI is writing. Because writing is the most critical skill I think you can have as a writer or as mm -hmm. a marketer to learn, like, because it's clarity mm -hmm. of thoughts. It's, it helps you to think in simple terms. So we kind of started in a really bad place, but I think where it actually really is useful is being able to take mass amounts of data and synthesize those things for you in categories or ways that you can use that data. I agree with you. And I, I would go a step further. Like, well, one, I, I came from a journalism background and I think a lot of marketers do. And you know, I spent years just figuring out how do you say a lot of stuff correctly and, and well. And I think AI right now is making us faster and it's making us more consistent. It's making us more effective. I think AI in the future will actually make us more creative and I think it will make us better. And I, I think what you said, right. Kieran, I actually think soon here, like right now, if I like tools like Jasper, I think you guys have talked to Megan, like I'm able to better understand what my tone of voice is and what it should be. And it helps me understand it. I think in the future, AI is going to help me know when my brand needs to start to evolve and tell me where it needs to go based on everything else it's processing and seeing, which is something mm. that it's, I mean, timing is everything in brand. I've, I've spent years evolving a brand only to find out I waited too long, you know, like, so I think AI will help us be better marketers in that sense, but it will take a little while to get there. Okay, we talked a lot about brand and I think we've tried to demystify brand for, I would say of all the aspects of marketing, brand is the hardest for the average founder or CEO to kind of like wrap their head around. 
one of the more logical parts of marketing is growth. And so talk to us about like demystify the logical part of marketing, the growth side of things. Like you have built some world-class growth engines. You work with folks at Reforge, Brian, Casey, a bunch of folks who have also built world-class growth engines. Like what are the secrets to doing that? I love the growth secrets. Uh, I'm also team logic. I, I as a child, I was a an everybody artist. wants them. I, uh, yep. Uh, as a child, I was very much creative and artist, but I found my path to growth and it just it works with my pragmatic brain. But listen, you want the secrets to growth. Here's my and I, I've worked at Reforge. I think I've worked with some of the best growth leaders out there. I think they're remarkable and know so much more than I do. But there's only three ways to grow a company. Acquire more people in retain them longer or monetize them better. And all three of those have, yeah, an, yeah I mean, exactly. all, all three of them have, you should have a North Star metric and input metrics. And every one of those input, me input metrics should have loops or channels behind them. Like there's a system to growth. The real challenge is aligning around those things. Teams don't know what business model they run. They don't know what their North Star metrics are. They don't have the data to track well, or they don't believe the data. So they misalign and they fight internally and there's drama and politics. And that's what kills growth. But growth itself is actually fairly simple if you treat it as a system and you work through the levers. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm on team growth is easier if you think about it than brand. Like brand is complex and often subjective. I think growth is easier but it's harder because of the internal reasons. It's harder for all the internal drama, you know? Ooh. It's so funny you said those three things. I was talking to a team very recently and they were like going back and forth on like the strategy. And I was like, I think the strategy is like pretty easy. Like there's three things you can do, like acquire on mass, have an engaged audience and like monetize them better over time and improve retention. That's it. Yep. That's all there is. <laughs> yep. I think the hard thing is, to your point, is like within that, like understanding, okay, within that, like what are the most important things to work on at any given point in time? And then like, what are the most important metrics? And then like, what are the mechanics to like make work? But I agree with like brand is like much more complex in terms of getting to like the core idea of it all. The growth thing is like the machine, the growth machine is like much more complex to get operationalized because of internal mechanics and understanding the metrics and what tactics to prioritize and why we're prioritizing those tactics. Okay, hold on, hold on. Re real talk, you, you two growth people, why is there so much drama <laughs> in growth? Why does it feel I like it should be a Bravo show? Every growth Every team time. I've ever talked to, it's like some Excel sheets and then like a bunch of like gossiping. <laughs> and it's like, how is that possible? Like, what is happening? Can somebody please explain it to me? No, Kip, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> need to do I a don't reality know. show of like growth. Yeah. I think one thing about this is we did it to ourselves. I think we made growth so complicated. We made it so special. And I, I like, it's not. Every strategy doc I've ever written for growth addresses those three levers. Every single one of them involves the same people product, <laughs> engineering, data. Every single one of them requires a forecast reconciliation with finance. Tops down, bottoms up, tops down. Like everything is the same. It's just, who am I going to fight with along the way? Like, and who, who, will they like me at the end, you know, and try to find the ways to work best together? So I don't know, other than maybe if I'm just putting my human hat on, it's very important. Like, I think anytime something feels so existential to a company, it there's a little drama, right? Like, What's our business strategy? What's our product strategy? What's our growth strategy? They feel like one-way doors. You don't want to mess that up. And I think the stakes feel higher. So maybe that's why, Kip, but the drama is real. The drama is real. What I just, yeah. heard, what I just heard you say is that growth is the hunger games of marketing <laughs> or a business. It's like the stakes are high and everybody wants to win. It is yeah, actually. Like, they, they will cut a bit to analogy. win. Yeah, and someone gets left out and shot at the end. And uh, <laughs> It's often the CMO that gets shot. Oh, the CMO is getting shot at the end. Like if you're in the horror movie and you're the CMO, you're <laughs> dead. You, you oh, might as well just done. like write yourself out of the script. Yeah. You're, get, you're, you're, you're definitely getting shot. <laughs> I agree with you, Joanna. I think it's like, very high stakes. Everyone wants to own this stuff. No one can own this stuff in totality because yeah. it's very cross-functional. And then so there's just a ton of drama about like who are the clear DRIs and 
there's like an unwillingness to just call out like, no, like these are the decision makers. It's like, oh, no, play nice together and everyone can have like an input and everyone can have a voice. And you're like, nah, that's not how this should actually work. Like it always should be much more top down than I think people think. It's like this kind of bottoms up, like we'll figure it out as a group was saying, come by ya, and we'll come to like some sort of great resolution. It should be tops down. And the CEO, I think often says like, my CPO and CMO should go figure this out. Like, keep me posted. I think the CEO has to be more involved. Like, I believe the CEO <laughs> owns growth and they shouldn't yeah. like be sitting back here, like, keep me posted. We need them in the room to help us prioritize, you know? Keep me posted and then the C- CMO and the CPO go into a room, beat the shit out of each <laughs> other, come back with bruises and like, it's not working. Fire that yep. person. Yep. Every <laughs> that time. person. Huh? I hate that person. They're in my idiot. life. It's, it's sad. Like it's literally sad. every time. I've never, I've never seen it not happen this way. I want to make sure we talk about something because I think the future of marketing is about great strategies coming together. And I, mm-hmm. I, I rarely see companies that have a really well-formed growth motion and like a really well-developed brand product positioning, brand story. Like, how do you bring those things together to actually build off of each other. Because Joanna, you're you're one of the few people I know that have like, I think have properly executed both in the same business and had them like working well with each other. And I think it'd be really helpful for everybody if you could kind of share kind of how you thought about it and how you made that happen. Thank you for that. I, I will say it was hard earned learnings. Like I did it wrong for a long time before I did it well. And I think I will always hopefully get a little better. But so I think of this, you know, pretty pretty much like you think of how do you bring any two functions together? Like if we think back 10 or 15 years, 10 or 12 years, like product and engineering were the teams that never got along, you know, and then there was a season where marketing and finance never got along. And I think brand and growth to me are absolutely required. They're like, you know, they're on the same kind of symbol of the infinity symbol. Brand helps you know who you are, what you stand for and how you're going to show up. You need that to execute growth well. Growth attracts people, activates them, and converts them. And you need all of that to grow your brand awareness and strength. So I think what, like, to get them to work well together, there needs to be extreme clarity on what both own and why. There needs to be a deep respect and sponsorship of both from the founder, from the CEO, from the entire executive team. They both need to be treated respectfully, they both need to be seen as levers for the business. But then there's like the tactical things, like, You know, you mentioned it, Kieran, like help keeping them with shared KPIs, co-authored strategy docs, right? So marketing isn't two docs written by two leaders. It's one. You have, you know, co-cadences, right? So your retros are together, your crit reviews are together, your weekly meetings are together. Like if, if you do it well for it to be done well, brand and growth, whoever owns it at the business, they need to feel like when they go into their performance reviews or they're up for promotion, if the other side isn't successful, they will not be successful. And I just think there's a lot you can do inside a company to make that work. And I've learned, I pull from what product and engineering has done, and I I apply that across brand and growth. The other thing that you have to deal with in that scenario as the kind of marketing slash growth leader is the founder has like biases towards one team where they're like, I understand the value of that team. And they're always, and they're like, cool, what's that team doing? And then the other conversation about the other team is like, do we really need that team? What uh-huh. do they do? And like yeah. your your kind of job as a founder is like to like make sure they understand the value in both those things. So they think of them like they they have equality in the founder's mind in terms of the value they bring to the company. Yeah. I think Kieran's saying all founders are basically Andy Cohen and are just playing referee <laughs> between all of like the reality TV show stars, <laughs> which is actually pretty true. I mean, it doesn't sound not true. No, I, I think I think you're right, Kieran. And I'll 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 just add, I think CEOs and founders for these two to work well together, there's going to be one they don't understand. And so when I vet like who I'm going to work with as a founder or CEO, I don't vet for them to understand both. That is a fool's errand. I vet their curiosity about the one they don't know. Like, are they genuinely curious about learning? Usually, brand like, and they and a lot of them are, but they're they're intimidated. So you start to bring them in, you start to make them feel better about it. You know, you kind of, you show them some things to learn and hopefully they get excited and and then you're set up for for success. And I think that's by far the biggest difference between companies that do a brand and growth well and companies that don't. Does the CEO have curiosity about both domains? You know, 
I love that. You you talk a lot about, we, we often talk a lot about interviewing our team members for curiosity and like growth mindset, not as often the CEO that you're going to go work with or work for. And so I love that uh, kind of connection back to it, Joanna. All right. Joanna's got a busy day of meetings. We <laughs> we stole uh, stole an hour of your time. You were amazing and gracious for, for giving us that. But we are we are at time. Thank you so much to Joanna Lord for joining us today. This has been an awesome conversation. We got to talk growth team drama, so I'm super happy. <laughs> uh, but we actually covered some meaningful ground on all things growth and brand. And so thank you so much. We'll see you real soon on Marketing Against the Grain. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Joanna. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 